Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to the very last episode of Hollow Week. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am the host of the Killer Instinct podcast. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday as well as here on YouTube every Thursday. As you guys can tell by the title of today's video, today we are talking about what is by far my most highly requested case ever. This is a case that has completely captivated the country and the world. And like I said, just has been very highly requested by you guys. So I thought for the very last episode of Hollow Week, we would close this all out by covering the Gabby Petito case. Now this case is a little trickier because this is a case that constantly has new updates and new developments really by the hour. While we are finally getting a little bit more closure on this case, I'm filming this on October 24th. There still are so many unanswered questions that we're going to kind of talk all through. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Before we get started, I do want to say that if you are out there wanting and wondering how you can support Gabby's family and really just honor her and her memory, Gabby's family has created a foundation in her honor. It is the Gabby Petito Foundation, and you can go to GabbyPetitoFoundation.org and check it all out. Her family has put together this incredible, incredible website, and you can also purchase different items. I know they're selling bracelets if you wanted to honor her that way, or if you just want to check out the website itself, you can do that as well. Gabrielle Venora Petito, also known as Gabby, was born on March 19th, 1999 in Blue Point, New York to her parents, Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt. Now, Gabby's parents got divorced when she was younger and they both went on to marry new people. And Gabby's parents, both of her parents, her dad and her stepmother, as well as her mom and her stepfather, they are the poster for what every co-parenting relationship should look like and what everyone should aspire to be. Watching the interviews of Gabby's parents, it is just very inspiring to see the relationship that they all have with each other. And it's something that I just think a lot of people should strive for. Now, Gabby's mother, Nicole, went on to marry a man named Jim and Gabby's father, Joe, married a woman named Tara. And Gabby is described by her friends and her family as someone that anyone could count on. She always wanted to help the people around her in any way that she could, and to know Gabby truly was to love her, and she was such a free spirit. She was incredibly creative. She loved drawing and painting and traveling. Traveling was a huge passion of Gabby's. Gabby truly wanted to experience everything that this world has to offer, and she loved exploring. She loved nature. She loved being outdoors and hiking. She was incredibly passionate about that. If you go to Gabby's Instagram page, you notice that she's always somewhere. She traveled all across the country from New York to Colorado to California, and she documented all of her trips along the way. Now, Gabby worked as a nutritionist, but more recently, she decided that she wanted to take her creativity as well as her passion for traveling and combine them. She created a YouTube channel called Nomadic Static, and this was basically a van life channel. Van life content is essentially exactly how it sounds, where people who live in their vans document and share their experience for people to either relate to and get tips from or just watch in awe of. I've seen a lot of comments from researching people who do van life content where people say, you know, this is so cool. I wish I could be able to do something like this. And it is a very, very popular sector of YouTube and something that van life creates creators and van life people in general seem to have in common is that they are very much minimalists. They're minimalists who enjoy the freedom that comes with living on a house on wheels, essentially. And that was Gabby. She loved taking trips and exploring and like I said, really just loved taking advantage of everything the world has to offer and really embrace nature. Now that kind of brings us up to this past summer, summer 2021. And in summer 2021, July to be exact, Gabby had planned a four month long road trip. This road trip was going to begin in July and it was going to end in October. And Gabby was not taking this road trip alone. She was going to be going with her boyfriend, a man named Brian Laundrie. 
Brian Laundry was born on November 18th, 1997 to his parents, Chris and Roberta, and he also has a sister named Cassie. Brian and Gabby met in high school. They both attended Bayport Blue Point High School, and when they first met, they didn't start dating right away, but they did hang out in the same social circle. Brian was a junior and Gabby was a sophomore, so they definitely knew of each other, but they didn't start dating and they weren't super close, and it wasn't until after high school that the two of them started dating. They had their first date on the beach and it was a sushi date and something that Brian and Gabby really bonded over was their love of adventure and nature in the outdoors. Similar to Gabby, Brian also loved being creative. He loved drawing and painting, which he expresses a lot on his Instagram. His first post on Instagram is actually a picture of him and Gabby and it's caption quote it's been an incredible year by far the best of my life i've been to so many beautiful places had so many amazing experiences and all with the best sidekick in the world end quote. Now, Brian and Gabby did end up getting engaged. At one point, a little over a year ago, Brian posted on his Instagram again and said, quote, my biggest fear is that one day I'll wake up and it will have all had been a dream because that is what every second has felt like since the moment we found each other. Till death do us part or until I wake up, I'm so happy the answer was yes. Love you, honey, end quote which reading that caption now is very eerie considering how everything has transpired. However, even though they did decide to get engaged, they also decided to end that engagement as well. And there isn't too much information on if this was Brian's decision or Gabby's decision. They both realized that they were pretty young to be getting engaged and neither of them really saw the rush. They knew they wanted to be together forever, but they saw no rush in putting that fiance label on it and so they decided to call it off again i'm not too certain if this was gabby's decision or brian's from what i've seen it looks like it was more of gabby's decision to revert back to the boyfriend girlfriend title but we don't have a definitive answer on that now brian is all about being very eco-friendly and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think the main argument is that that is actually a very good quality to have, is to be cautious and to live an eco-friendly lifestyle. I don't think anyone can sit here and say that that's necessarily a bad thing. However, the problem with Brian is how he expressed it. In his Instagram, it is very clear that Brian puts himself on this pedestal and he thinks he is better than and greater than everyone else simply because he is living this eco-friendly lifestyle. He doesn't wear shoes. He doesn't use plastic. He's just, he lives this lifestyle. Brian posted a picture on Instagram and it was a picture of a tree and he captioned it and said, quote, this tree doesn't require an Apple watch. It doesn't stream its favorite shows or have a microwave oven, doesn't pay health insurance, or drink grande iced caramel macchiatos. It is just a tree, but you rarely see it riding jet skis or wearing designer clothing either, end quote. Now, that tone in that caption, and I could be reading way too much into this, but I don't think that I am. The tone of that caption is very much condescending. Everyone knows trees don't wear an Apple watch. Everyone knows they don't drink Starbucks. He's talking down to everyone, and all in all, he just seems like a very angry person. Now, when it comes to Brian and Gabby's relationship, Gabby's family has said that the two of them really bonded and found each other because both of them were outcasts. They had their quirks, they had their differences, and they were able to bond through that. Now, one of Gabby's best friends has come out and shed some light on her relationship with Brian. And according to this friend, she said that Brian was extremely controlling over Gabby. She mentioned one instance where Gabby was going to be going out with this specific friend and they were going to go for drinks or something casual. And Brian was furious and didn't want her to go. So he ended up stealing her ID. That way she wouldn't have been able to get in anywhere. And Gabby did 
didn't realize this until halfway to going to her friend's house. So she had to go home. It created this massive fight between the two of them. But all in all, it was said that Brian definitely had a jealous side and he was very possessive over Gabby. Now, at the time of Brian and Gabby's road trip, they were living in Northport, Florida. Now, there has been some conflicting reports that say that they were permanently living in Roberta and Chris's home, which are Brian's parents. However, recently there's been more developments that said they actually didn't permanently live with Roberta and Chris. And in fact, Roberta and Chris got them a condo near where Brian's parents live and that they were financing and basically paying for this condo. So now let's talk about this road trip that Brian and Gabby took. This road trip started on July 2nd, 2021. And according to Gabby's parents, this is a trip that Gabby and Brian had been planning for a long time. They had been saving money. They had been meticulously planning it, mapping out everywhere they wanted to go, everywhere they wanted to hike, just in order to make this the most fulfilling trip possible. Like I said, this was a four-month road trip, and they were planning on sleeping in Gabby's van the entire way through it. Now, Gabby's van is a white 2012 Ford Transit van. It has a license plate that read QFT G03. And this van actually belonged to Gabby, but the two of them were using it for their road trip together. Now, based off of what we know from Instagram, the first stop that Brian and Gabby took was documented on July 4th after they stopped at the Monument Rocks National Landmark in Gov County, Kansas. Now, these are also known as chalk pyramids. So this was their first documented stop. Gabby posted a picture on Instagram standing underneath one of the rocks with the caption, quote, there's no place like the tiny home we built, end quote. She tagged Brian's Instagram as well in this picture. Brian also posted a picture captioning it, quote, downsizing our life to fit into this itty bitty van was the best decision we've ever made. With limited space, we wanted to take advantage of every inch while also keeping everything minimalist, end quote. Then just four days later, on July 8th through the 11th, Gabby and Brian were staying in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and Gabby posted about being at the Great Sand Dunes National Park, which is just a little south of Colorado Springs. Now, it was clear that Gabby was absolutely loving this part of the trip. She talked about in her post how her and Brian were able to grab last minute overnight passes that usually were sold out, but they managed to get two overnight passes for two nights. So she was really excited. Brian also posted a picture talking about how he was happy to be able to surf the sand dunes and how he's never tasted that much sand before. And he also tagged Gabby in his picture. Now, Gabby posted two more photos after that, still at the sand dunes, and on her last picture there, she said that their next stop was going to be going to Utah. Her and Brian traveled to Zion National Park, and Gabby posted about being there on the 16th and said that her and Brian had been camping there for two nights, meaning that they had to have gotten there on the 14th of July. Now, both Gabby and Brian posted multiple pictures at Zion and they were seemingly having an amazing time. Now, I want to pause right now and talk quickly about Gabby and Brian's YouTube channel because I know I mentioned it in the beginning, but I want to go over it again now. Now, this YouTube channel was also a blog that Gabby was working on and it was called Nomadic Static. This again was going to be a van life YouTube channel. That was the whole basis surrounding it. It was going to be about Gabby and Brian documenting their van life experience. We're going to talk about when Gabby and Brian posted this YouTube video a little bit later. However, in Utah is basically when they stopped filming. So they stopped filming. Their last part was at Capitol Reef. That is where they last mentioned being in this YouTube video. Now, Capitol Reef is about a three and a half hour drive from Zion. So basically what to note there is that around this time is when they stopped 
vlogging is when they were in Utah. Now, what we know based off of Instagram is that after they went to Zion, they then posted about being in the Canyon Lands. And the Canyon Lands are about two and a half hours from Capitol Reef and three and a half hours from Zion. So what we know is that on July 16th, they were in Zion. And then on the 21st, they were in Bryce Canyon National Park. Then on the 28th of July, they were in the Canyon Lands. Now, I'm sure that some of you have seen the Nomadic Static YouTube channel and the video itself. And I feel like this goes without saying, but I also feel like I have to mention it because in this video, Brian and Gabby seem extremely happy. They just seem very excited and ready to embark on this entire adventure. And they seem like they're having a great time together. They're laughing, they're joking, they're having fun. But I think that it so important to reiterate that it is so easy to hide behind a facade on social media and that you shouldn't believe everything you see on social media and you should really just take it for face value. And I think the reason, this is my personal belief, I think part of the reason that Gabby's case has captivated everyone is because I think people realize that they either could be Gabby or they could have been Gabby. I think it's very, very easy for certain people to look back on relationships that they had and realize that if they didn't get out or if they don't get out, that they could be Gabby. Now in this YouTube video, which is an eight minute video, there is some speculation about one clip in the video. And in that clip, people wonder if Gabby was crying right before she started filming. Her face is really red. She looks really tired and looks as if she could have been crying. However, it also could have been that she was just tired. So we really don't know on that one. So Gabby posted a picture on Instagram on July 31st at the Canyon Lands, and this was her last post before taking a 12-day break on Instagram. Gabby usually never went that long, especially on the road trip from posting on Instagram. She was pretty much constantly keeping people updated on what she was doing and where she was going. So the fact that she took a 12-day break is pretty interesting and does make you wonder what was going going on in those 12 days, but that takes us to August 12th, 2021. So on August 12th, there was a 911 call made from someone who claimed to have seen Brian and Gabby. On this call, the person claimed that they saw Brian hit Gabby and that the two of them were arguing. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this footage or at least had heard about it, but I'm going to break it down a little bit for you. So this call was made in Moab, Utah. So the Moab police responded to the call and the very first responding officer from the Moab police department was Daniel Scott Robbins. He was the one who originally followed up on the call and ended up finding Gabby and Brian driving really recklessly on the road, along with the fact that he was going to pull them over anyways because of this domestic violence incident. He also pulled them over for very reckless driving. Brian was driving 45 miles per hour in a 15 mile per hour zone. He was also swerving so badly that he ended up hitting a curb and officers also saw him cross a double yellow line. So with all of those things considered, the authorities decided to pull over Brian and Gabby. Now, the first thing that Officer Robbins noticed when approaching the car is that Gabby was in the passenger seat of the van and she was hysterically crying. So obviously he decided that the best thing to do would be to separate the two of them. So he had Gabby stand over to one side while Brian stood off in another area with other officers who at that point also arrived. Now, Gabby is basically asked what the situation was and what was going on between the two of them. And Gabby said that her and Brian had been fighting all morning. And she also said that she has OCD and it can heavily affect her and her mood when things aren't done a particular way. Gabby said that she was also apologizing to Brian for being in a bad mood or if she was being mean. She tells the officer that she quit her nutritionist job to start a van life blog, but that Brian doesn't really believe in it and that he doesn't believe she can succeed. Gabby said that Brian locked her out of her car and told her that she needed to calm down. Now, the initial conversation with Gabby lasted about three minutes before the officer walked over to Brian. So when the cops went and talked to Brian, Brian 
tells them that Gabby gets really worked up sometimes and when that happens, he tries to distance himself from her and he said that particular morning, the two of them got into a fight because Brian was trying to get Gabby to finish up her work so they could get their day started and Brian said Gabby got really heated at him and ended up hitting him with her cell phone. Brian said he did lock the car so Gabby couldn't get in but he also said he wasn't in the car either so he locked both of them out of the car essentially because Brian said he was trying to walk off. Brian also blamed his reckless driving on Gabby and said the reason he hit the curb is because Gabby grabbed the steering wheel. So he completely blamed that all on Gabby. And the cops have gotten a lot of heat for this conversation because from the video footage, the cops look very buddy-buddy with Brian. They're talking to him kind of more so in a friendly manner. And when it came to Gabby, it almost seemed like they were treading lightly. You could just tell by their tone of voice that how they viewed Gabby was very different from how they they viewed Brian. Now, that's not to say that they didn't spend a lot of time with them and try to evaluate the situation because they actually spent more than over an hour with Gabby and Brian talking all of this out. But regardless of that, it was also as if they already had a preconceived notion that Brian was the victim. When I think it's very clear based off of just anyone who's seen this footage, that Gabby is not okay, that something is very wrong. This is not a reaction of someone that's just really stressed out. This is someone that was crying out for help, essentially. And after talking to Brian and Gabby, the cops decided that instead of filing this incident as a domestic assault, they declared it a quote-unquote mental slash emotional health break. Not only that, they went out of their way to tell Gabby that they would not be filing charges against her for the domestic violence assault. Now, here is my issue and my two cents on this. Calling this a mental health break is essentially saying that Gabby's overreacting and she just had a breakdown and that is what happened here. When in reality, I don't think the time was taken to maybe look a little deeper past the surface level to see what was really going on. Watching the footage back now, it's easy for us to sit here and say, Brian's playing the police, he's being so manipulative, he's so narcissistic. And that's what's really upsetting because that's what we know now. Now we know that that was the issue, but Brian is so good at manipulating. I also will say that Brian did have the majority of the visible wounds. He had cuts on his hands and a mark on his eye. So it was clear that Gabby also did assault Brian as well. But to automatically assume that Gabby was the only aggressor in this is just very upsetting to see. So along with claiming this as a mental health break, the police also decided that they were going to separate Gabby and Brian for the night. They said that they were going to put Brian in a hotel hotel and that they were going to give Gabby the van. Now, police have gotten a ton of backlash on this, and it's mainly because they said, why on earth wouldn't police put Gabby in the hotel and give Brian the van? Now, the thing I will say here is that Gabby legally owned that van, and that van was her home for all things considered. It's where she slept, all of her belongings were there. So while it would have been more chivalrous to give Gabby the hotel, it also makes sense that she was given the van because legally she owns it. Now, something very bizarre about this interaction with the police on Brian's side is that Brian went out of his way to tell police that he does not have a cell phone. He said that he doesn't have a phone, so if Gabby were to leave him, he would be screwed. But then just a couple minutes later into this conversation, Brian then pulls out a cell phone from his pocket. Now, we don't know if that's Gabby's cell phone or his cell phone, but what we do know is that when police asked Gabby if there was anything that she she wanted them to tell Brian before they separated, Gabby said, make sure he has his phone charger. So clearly, Brian has a phone to some extent, and it makes no sense to me personally why he would go out of his way 
to lie about it. Now, what we know is that on the following day, August 13th, Brian Laundry posted his final Instagram picture. He tagged the location of the picture as Moab, Utah, and followed it with a very lengthy caption that I mentioned earlier about how trees don't need an Apple Watch and they don't watch Netflix or have a microwave oven. Six days later on the 19th is when Gabby and Brian posted their first and only YouTube video. Like I said earlier, this video was eight minutes long and it documented their van life and it was actually very good quality. Gabby had so much potential in turning this passion of hers into something. Now, what we know from Gabby's family is that on the 21st of August, Gabby had a FaceTime call with her dad, Joe. And according to Joe, he said that him and Gabby were working on her nomadic static website. She also told Joe that she was going to be having a little bit of shaky reception. She wasn't going to be able to be as communicative in the following days because they were planning on going to Yellowstone. And according to Joe, he said this conversation seemed completely normal. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Nothing seemed wrong. He said that he ordered food for Gabby and Brian that night from Domino's, and he just had a great conversation with his daughter. Now, on August 24th, Gabby was seen leaving a hotel in Salt Lake City, Utah with Brian. The hotel was a Fairfield Inn and Suites located near the Salt Lake City International Airport. On August 25th, Gabby spoke with her family on the phone, and she told them that her and Brian we're going to the Grand Teton National Park. The Grand Tetons are a mountain range in Wyoming and the mountains extend for about 40 miles. So that was the last time her family heard her voice was August 25th. On August 25th, Gabby also posted her last Instagram picture. Now this picture was basically a collage of pictures of Gabby. There were six pictures in the slide and the first five were of Gabby in front of this butterfly mural holding a crocheted pumpkin and the last was a mirror selfie. There's a couple things about this picture that come off as a little bizarre. Now the first was it was only August 25th and while people do like to get into the spirit early, it just seemed like a very random post. Along with that, Gabby used to tag all of her locations. If you look at all of her other Instagram pictures, they all have a location tagged on them, but this one didn't. Along with that, people have pointed out that her hair also seems shorter in these pictures and she's not dressed in hiking attire. So people believe that these pictures could have been old pictures and people believe that Brian could have possibly been the one to post them. On August 27th, witnesses saw Brian and Gabby together at the Mary Piglet's restaurant located in Jackson, Wyoming. And this was the last reported sighting of Gabby. Now, according to the people at the restaurant, Brian had gotten into arguments with multiple of the female employees at the restaurant and he kept storming in and out of the restaurant and it was said that during this time, Gabby was visibly upset. She was crying and she actually left the restaurant and stood outside to try and get Brian to leave with her. Now, on August 30th, Gabby's mom, Nicole, received a very interesting text. She received a text from Gabby that said, quote, no service in Yosemite. Now, the reason that that text is so bizarre is because Gabby never mentioned to her family that she was going to Yosemite. She told them that she was going to Yellowstone. Now, Yellowstone is also in Wyoming where the Grand Tetons are. It's about 40 minutes from the Grand Tetons. And so at first, her family assumed that maybe this text was a typo and it just auto-corrected to Yosemite. However, now they're pretty much convinced that it was Brian who sent them that text message and he made a very big error in sending that text message. On the 27th of August, which was when Brian and Gabby were seen at Mary Piglet's, Nicole got another text from Gabby that asked her if she could help Stan, which is Gabby's grandfather, and said that she just keeps getting voicemails and missed calls from him. Now, Gabby's mother thought that this was also very bizarre because Gabby's grandfather is named Stan. However, Gabby never referred to him as Stan, which has made Gabby's parents question if maybe Brian was the one that also sent that text message as well. 
Now, as you know, there have been an overwhelming amount of people that are talking about this case. Every single person, I have not met one person that does not know about this case. And when that happens, a lot of times it brings on false narratives and false facts. It's really difficult to try and figure out what's real and what's not. But I want to talk about something that was very interesting that has actually helped a lot in this case. And that is when a TikToker came forward and said that Brian Laundrie had actually hitchhiked with her, gotten in her car to hitchhike on August 29th. A TikToker named Miranda Baker said on the 29th, her and her boyfriend picked up Brian Laundrie at 5.30 p.m. at Coulter Bay. She said that he was wearing pants, a long sleeve shirt, hiking boots, and had on a backpack. She said that Brian had approached her and her boyfriend in their Jeep and said that he needed to go to Jackson, which coincidentally, Miranda and her boyfriend were going to as well. Now, Brian got into the back of their car and they started driving. But shortly into their drive, Brian realized quickly, or at least this is the assumption, that they were not going to the same place. Miranda and her boyfriend were going to Jackson Hole, and it is believed that Brian was trying to go to Jacksonville, Florida. Now, Jackson is kind of what the locals call Jackson Hole. So when Brian told them that he was going to Jackson, that is what Miranda and her boyfriend assumed. People also believe this because Brian offered to pay Miranda and her boyfriend $200 to hitchhike with them. And a lot of people believe that he would have never paid that much money if he thought that he was only going 10 or so miles. So according to Miranda, Brian freaked out and told them that they needed to pull the car over right then and there and he got out of the car but before he did he let Miranda and her boyfriend in on a little bit about himself. Brian had told Miranda that he had been camping for multiple days without his fiance. He said that his fiance was back working in their van on their social media website and told them that they were camping along the Snake River. Now, when Brian got out of the car, that was the last time that Miranda and her boyfriend ever saw or heard from Brian. Now, on September 1st, it was confirmed by the Northport Police Department that that was the day that Brian returned home to his parents' house in Gabby's van, but without Gabby. Now, Gabby's parents had no idea that Brian was home. They went 10 days not hearing from Brian, not hearing from Gabby, not hearing from Brian's parents. And it was the beginning of September when Gabby's family started to grow more and more concerned. And they started texting Roberta and Chris, Brian's parents, saying, Do we know what's going on? Are they okay? Because at first, Gabby's parents assumed that Gabby and Brian were still together. Therefore, they were worried about both of their safeties. However, they had no idea that Brian was at his house the entire time. And the reason that they found out about it is because on September 11th, when Gabby's family filed a missing persons report, they gave the police all the information on Gabby's van. And once police went back to track the van, they tracked it straight to Brian's parents' house. And that is when police informed Gabby's family that Brian had been here the entire time. So like I said, the missing persons report was filed on September 11th. Her family hadn't heard from her since August 25th, at least heard her voice, and she wasn't seen since August 27th. So all of this time has gone by and no one has heard or seen Gabby. Now let's talk about what Brian and the laundries did to help try and find Gabby. Now the short answer to that question is absolutely nothing and just about everything except trying to actually help find Gabby. You guys saw the news. This was a massive, massive search and you know how many people have been on top of this. However, the only people who haven't are the laundries. Gabby's parents said that they consistently tried to get in contact with Brian and his family. However, they would not respond to any of their phone calls or any of their texts. And along with that, during the time frame that the van was in the driveway and no one knew it was there, the Laundries had a perfect opportunity to try and get rid of any and all evidence. On September 4th, it was reported that Brian had opened a new cell phone account with AT&T, and Brian's attorney has claimed that this phone is not a burner phone and that Brian just got a new cell phone. Now let's talk about this camping trip because from September 6th through September 
8th, it was confirmed that Roberta, Chris, and Brian had all gone to the Fort DeSoto Park and camped there for two nights. This campsite is about 75 miles away from the laundry home, and they drove to the campsite in a red Dodge pickup truck. Now, a big theory in this case that a lot of people had is that a lot of people assumed that Brian could have used this camping trip as an opportunity to get a head start and escape. Because if you didn't know, on the 17th of September, Brian Laundry was reported as a missing person. And I want to mention that Brian Laundry was never a missing person and that Brian Laundry was always a person on the run. And there is a huge difference. Brian Laundry was never missing. And I will talk about how it was discovered that he was missing. However, the theory is that from September 6th through the 8th, this was his parents kind of send off and allowing him to get a head start before all eyes really did turn on him. Now on the 17th of September, that was a Friday and Roberta and Chris had called the authorities and asked them to come to their house. And at first authorities thought that the laundries were finally going to start talking. They're finally going to get some information. However, when they arrived at the house, Roberta and Chris informed them that they hadn't seen Brian for three days. They said the last time they saw Brian was on September 14th when he left to go on a hike at the Carlton Reserve. Brian's parents said that he left their house in their silver Mustang car and drove it to the Carlton Reserve. And this car was actually found on the 14th at the Carlton Reserve. And it was found by a police officer who gave it a parking ticket. However, this officer never ran the plates of the car. And if he did, he would have figured out that it was Brian laundry's car. Brian's parents said that when he never came home on the 14th, they went out to look for him at the Carlton Reserve and saw the car, however thought that if Brian came back, he would need the car to get home, so they ended up leaving the car there. But then they also said that on the day that they informed police, which was the 17th, they went back to the Carlton Reserve and the car was still there again, but this time they decided to bring it back home. Now, what's interesting about this whole silver Mustang car is that search dogs never picked up Brian's scent from that car. So after the 17th, the car was sitting in his driveway, but search dogs never found his scent on it. Now, according to Brian's parents, they swear up and down that Brian did come home with them after the camping trip from the 6th to the 8th, but no one physically saw him since then. And I think that is the biggest confusing question mark here is that how on earth did Brian Laundry leave his home without anyone seeing? him. By the 14th of September, everyone knew about this case. This case was very, very well known. You had protesters outside of their house. You had media, you had police all surrounding this home. And Brian somehow was able to get out of the house into his car and leave. However, no one saw it. There is not one person who has come forward and said, oh yeah, I saw him walk out of the house. He had to have walked out of his house to some capacity to get in that car to get to the Carlton Reserve if that is the actual story if he did leave on the 14th. But the fact that no one saw him leave, that part doesn't make sense. Now on September 15th, Brian Laundry was named a person of interest in Gabby's disappearance because at that point she still was missing. And Brian was not talking. He was not cooperating. Obviously at this point, no one knew where he was, but Brian's family did release a statement on the 15th that said, quote, many people are wondering why Mr. Laundry would not make a statement or speak with law enforcement in the face of Miss Petito's absence. In my experience, intimate partners are often the first person law enforcement focuses their attention on in cases like this. And the warning that any statement made will be used against you is true, regardless of whether my client had anything to do with Miss Petito's disappearance. As such, on the advice of counsel, Mr. Laundry is not speaking on this matter. I have been informed that the Northport Police have named Brian Laundry as a person of interest in this matter. This formality has not really changed the circumstances of Mr. Laundry being the focus and attention of law enforcement, and Mr. Laundry will continue to remain silent on the advice of counsel. 
end quote. So let's talk about the Carlton Reserve for a moment. This is where Brian's family said that he was going on the 14th and then he never came back. So the Carlton Reserve is located in Venice, Florida. It's about 13 miles away from Brian's home and it is a giant, giant area. It's over 24,000 acres. Of course, the big question here is, first of all, how the hell did Brian leave that house? But second, why would his parents, knowing the situation, wait three whole days before telling police? Something else that's interesting is when the Laundries had invited police over to tell them about Brian's disappearance, they had their attorney on the phone with them the entire time, making sure that they said the right thing and that they didn't answer a question that they didn't have to. Brian did not bring a phone with him when he left for the Carlton Reserve on the 14th, and so they weren't able to track him that way either. And I also want to mention this just because it has been brought up and it's a little bizarre. And at first, everyone was assuming that he left on the 14th because that is when his parents said that he left. However, recently, the family attorney has come forward and said that he didn't leave on the 14th and that he actually left on the 13th. You would think you would know what day your son went quote unquote missing. You would think you would know all of these things, but the lawyer of the laundries said that they just didn't remember and that they were going off of the last time they talked about him. If that doesn't make sense to you, it's because it doesn't make sense. Now, here is another part where social media plays a huge factor in this case, and there was a vlogging YouTube channel called Red, White, and Bethune, and they just so happened to be taking a video for their YouTube channel on a GoPro when they picked up footage of Gabby's van. This was a massive break in this case, and it's ultimately what led authorities to Gabby. On September 19th, authorities announced that they had discovered remains in the Grand Teton National Park. And what we know now is that those remains were identified as belonging to Gabby and her cause of death has been revealed. Her death has been named a homicide and her cause of death was strangulation. The following day after Gabby's body was recovered on September 20th, law enforcement swarmed the laundry home to search through it, and that is when that home, the laundry family home, was labeled a crime scene. On Wednesday, September 22nd, the District of Wyoming issued an arrest warrant for Brian, but not for what you might think. The warrant was issued for a violation of use of an unauthorized access device, and this was because Brian had charged $1,000 to Gabby's debit card. So even even though there was a warrant out for his arrest, it was not for Gabby's murder. So let's talk about the search for Brian and where this leads us to where we are today. The majority of this search was focused on the Carlton Reserve because that is the last place that Brian's parents said he was at. Now, I want to mention that this time of the year, it is the rainy season. So a lot of that reserve is covered in water. Now, I'm sure as you guys know, Dog the Bounty Hunter also joined in on the search for Brian and if you don't know who that is, Dog the Bounty Hunter is a man named Dwayne Chapman, and he has a TV show about being a bounty hunter. And if you don't know what a bounty hunter is, it's basically a guy who goes out and independently catches criminals. Now, he first showed up right at the laundry home, and his wife and daughter have also been in on this case and trying to help. According to Dog's wife, she has said that it wasn't Brian with the burner phone, but it's actually Roberta with the burner phone. Now, media has asked the FBI if this is true, and they have not confirmed nor denied that Roberta has a burner phone. So on October 19th, Roberta and Chris were seen out running errands, and one of those errands included going to the AT&T store. However, it was closed. Now, Dog did his own search at the Fort DeSoto Park, and that came up completely empty. Now, police were going to move their search to the Appalachian Trails because so many people have claimed to have seen Brian Laundry, to have spoken to him. So many people have all of these crazy stories about seeing Brian, and a lot of them centered in the Appalachian Trails, so authorities were going to move their search there. On October 7th, Brian's father, Chris, actually went out to the Carlton Reserve and helped police in 
the search. He showed up and drove around on a Polaris with some of the police officers, and a lot of people had mixed opinions about this. Some people believed that him doing this was a perfect opportunity to deter police away from where Brian actually was, because the general consensus here is that Roberta and Chris knew where Brian was this entire time. And a big reason that they believe that is one of two things. One, they have not helped in the search at all. They have not talked about Gabby at all. They have not been sympathetic to that situation in the slightest. They have not offered their help at all, not returning Gabby's parents' phone calls and text messages and all of that. And along with that, their behavior does not coincide with someone who is worried about their son. Now, granted, you could argue the fact that everyone handles these types of situations differently. And obviously it is very rare that a case gets this much attention and that there's protesters at your house and all of these threats are coming at you. That's not typical in these types of cases. However, to act like everything is completely fine is also not typical. Now, I also want to point out what we know now is that on August 17th, Brian actually flew back to Florida by himself. So this was 10 days before the final sighting of Gabby. He flew back to Florida to spend time with his family, and then he flew back out to meet Gabby on August 23rd. Now, Cassie has been the most forthcoming in the media in regards to the Laundry family. She is the only one that's talking to the media. And while she says she does doesn't know what happened. She doesn't know where Brian is. She doesn't want to believe that Brian could do this. She's also said that her parents will not talk to her and they've kind of shunned her out as well. So that all brings us, all of that information brings us to October 20th, 2021. Now, the day prior on the 19th, Chris and Roberta had informed the FBI that they were going to come out and help in the search for Brian the next morning. Now, this is very bizarre because they have never once, other than Chris going that one time on the 7th, offered to help, offered to talk. They have done nothing. So on the 19th, the FBI got a very surprising phone call saying that they were going to come join the next day. Now, the following morning, the 20th, authorities met Chris and Roberta at the Carlton Reserve. Now, within the first 30 minutes, you had Roberta, Chris, and an officer all walking along a trail that, according to Chris and Roberta, was one of Brian's favorite trails. Now, you would think maybe you wouldn't. This is just me. You would think that if Brian had a favorite trail, wouldn't you suggest that? Maybe. I don't know. I could be crazy, but I think maybe you suggest that in the very beginning, not a month later, and you now come forward and say, maybe we should check this out. So they're walking along this favorite trail. And at this point, Chris veers off and goes into the woods and he's kind of searching in a zigzag manner. And the officer that was walking with them went to the other side of the trail and did a similar search through the woods. And then Roberta was walking straight along the trail. Now, right when Chris got into the woods, he discovered a dry bag. You've had the entire world searching for Brian Laundry for a month, and Chris was able to find this dry bag within the first 30 minutes. And this dry bag was 20 feet away from the trail. Now, according to the Laundry's lawyer, Chris didn't want to pick up the dry bag, and he wanted authorities to come over and pick it up. But at the time, there were no authorities around him. So he decided to pick up the dry bag and brought it over to authorities. And when he brought it over to authorities, authorities informed Chris and Roberta that they had also just found a backpack and a notebook belonging to Brian. Not only did they find a backpack and a notebook, they also found partial remains. Also, if you're unfamiliar with what a dry bag is, it's essentially exactly how it sounds. It's a bag that keeps things dry inside of it. So authorities inform Chris and Roberta that they discovered partial remains. Now, not a lot has been released about these remains. However, what we do know as of October 24th, these remains were in fact skeletal remains. And through dental records, it has been confirmed that those remains belonged to Brian 
laundry. Now, as far as cause of death, we do not know because they were skeletal remains and they can't do an autopsy on them. I think they tried to do an autopsy, but it came back as inconclusive because the only real way to figure out how he died is if he had some sort of blunt force trauma to his skull or something like that. Like if he had fallen in water and drowned or if he drowned himself, we wouldn't be able to figure that out at this point because of the condition that the remains were in. So that is where we are today. That is what we know so far. We found Brian's remains. We have Gabby's remains. We know how Gabby died, but we don't know how Brian died. And let's kind of just walk through Brian and his remains and all of that. Again, nothing about this makes sense considering like I said earlier, you've had the entire world looking for this man for the past over a month. And within 30 minutes, his dad, his dad who was kept quiet this entire time, is able to recover some of his items. Now, a lot of people believe, and this is a theory that I've, I've seen many theories. I've seen theories that say that this is all part of his plan and that Brian is still out there and that the laundries gave police false medical records. I have seen theories that said that Brian killed someone else and planted those remains there. The theory that I'm seeing people lean towards the most in terms of it seeming the most real realistic is that Brian's parents knew where he was the entire time. They knew the exact location of where he was and they had been in contact with him through a burner phone or through some sort of phone, but they were in contact with him. But the theory goes is that more recently, Brian has not contacted his family back and they started to get worried. And once they started to actually get worried is when they finally told police. Here's why I don't believe that theory. The reason I don't believe that theory is that if Chris and Roberta recently started to get worried because they haven't heard from Brian, I think the condition of the remains would have been very different. These are purely skeletal remains and it's being said that these remains were submerged underwater and that's why they weren't found sooner. And when remains are underwater, they tend to decompose quicker. However, these are skeletal remains. So if that theory is true, Brian had to have not been in contact with his parents for a long time. So that's the only reason I'm skeptical about that is just because of the condition of his remains. If, if he had not been decomposed by the time that he was found, I would a thousand percent fully believe that. But that is the reason I have a hard time believing that this was a recent thing, that they just so recently haven't been able to talk to him. The way that this case is ending is incredibly disappointing. And the reason it's disappointing is because Gabby is not going to be able to get the justice that she deserves. If Brian committed suicide, he took the coward route. I personally don't necessarily see another option of him not committing suicide. I don't think he was murdered. I don't think his death was accidental. I think that if that is him and those are his remains, which it's been confirmed, I think he definitely took his own life. I think he knew that this wasn't going to end well for him. And I think that he knew the severity of the situation. And I think that he took his own life to spare his. So here are my biggest questions in this case, and you guys can let me know yours. My first one is, how on earth did no one see Brian leave that house that day? That does not make any sense to me. I cannot think of a single explanation where that makes sense. The second is, why did Brian's parents just wake up on the 19th and say, you know what, we're going to go help. I feel like now we should go help. We've been quiet for over a month, but now we're going to go help. And third, if they are completely innocent, why would they have not told police this sooner? It does not make sense to me why they wouldn't have told authorities about this trail that Brian likes to go on. Those are my questions. That is the Gabby Petito case. I cannot wait to hear your thoughts on it. All right, you guys, that is going to be all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode here of Killer Instinct. And thank you so much for listening to the last episode of Hollow Week. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and on YouTube every Thursday. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe, guys. Bye. Thank you guys so much for watching today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you tune in next week where we talk all about the unsolved case of the Springfield Three. This is a case of three women who went missing in 1992 and to this day it is still unsolved. I cannot wait to hear your guys' theories about it. You are not going to want to miss it. I'll see you there.